Hi, everyone. Very good evening. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Um, this is Eugene, if you haven't met me last night. And it's great to see all of you coming back uh, for the second day of our ITF community program. Uh, it's good to see all of you once again. So without further ado, I'm just going to flash up the slides to get a good introduction of what we're going to be covering this evening. Okay, so once again, welcome everyone. So second day of what we'll be covering. And I have with my greatest pleasure to invite the speaker for tonight, Dr. Retka. And he will be covering on the topic together with myself uh, on long-term athlete development. Dr. Retka, over to you. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, here, here. Okay, yes, yes, perfect. Here. So, uh, Eugene, thank you very much. So, I'm Dr. Kausub Radkar, based in Pune. Uh, uh, just a small, small background. I started swimming when I was eight years old. Uh, so, I've been an athlete for 31 years so far. I'm the only athlete currently to finish 25 full Ironmans and I'm certified by the International Olympic Committee. Uh, this topic is very, very close to my heart. Uh, it's something I face day in and day out with uh, my personal coaching, and it's something uh, us at ITF would really like to explore. Um, I know there's a lot of good coaches, uh, parents, uh, mentors, some athletes here. So I'll talk for some time and, and we'll ro leave room for discussion at the end. Um, give you a little we are going to cover. So the topic overview um, is basically we're going to understand, uh, you know, the different growth uh, and development variations in children. More importantly, in the environment, which is very, very important, um, you know, not a lot of us, including me at the point, uh, had experience uh, in dealing with young kids. So it's a completely different phenomenon. Um, obviously, we'll discuss some of the skills necessary to uh, create training fun uh, for both children and youth. And then obviously, we're, we're going to give you a little overlay of how to plan training uh, for children. Uh, please understand in one hour, it's going to be difficult to give it the whole rule book, but uh, we'll do our best. So Eugene okay. has a has a question. Yes, thank you, Dr. Rector. Uh, I hope all of you can hear me loud and clear. Um, let's start off today's topic with looking at this picture. Uh, so this is a picture taken by myself. I have got uh, athletes in this picture. Uh, this picture was taken in 2016. And before I tell you a little more information, very quickly, I'd like you just to type into the chat. Tell me how old do you think these guys are? Just quickly type it in the chat. Type in the age. 18 to 20, 20, 15, 30, 17. Keep it going. 16, under 23, 14, 14 to 20. That's a huge age gap. 12 to 18, 15, 16. Okay, so... I think everyone has uh, given their input is quite a large range from 12 to 30, 46, well done. <laughs> okay, so what? thank you for your response, everyone. What I'm trying to now give you would be the exact details of these uh, gentlemen. So this race was in uh, Australia. It was a Oceania uh, Youth Junior Cup. So it's a bit different, it's not you really a junior. It was only for boys from the ages of 16 and 17 years old of age only. I'll repeat that, the 16 or 17 years of age only. So 
what that means is all of these guys here are actually of that age group, okay? Now, if you can see the guy in blue, just give me a thumbs up if you can see the guy in blue. Can you guys see the guy in blue? Show me a thumbs up, yep. So that's one of the boys I, 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 I'm still currently coaching, okay? So he was 17 years of age. And the guy beside him, two down, the guy in black. So the guy in blue and two guys down on black, that's his uh, a fellow uh, countryman, also 17 years of age. Now, the guy in blue at this age was standing at 1.75 meters tall. And obviously from this picture, you can also see that the chap over here jumping, even though he's jumping, he's obviously way taller than uh, 1.8. Okay, and if you look at the extreme ends, you might see some of these boys on the left, a very well-built guy. And that's why maybe some of you may say they are in their late 20s or 30s. And on the furthest right, you can see one small little looking guy that looks like a pre adolescence So what I'm trying to tell you guys is just by looking at the body structure, and this is going to lead into this evening's presentation, we can't really tell a real age, especially if you're working with youths, because there's so many factors that we need to consider, which I'm going to hand it back over to Dr. Repka to give you more information. And I hope it can now give you a better set mindset of understanding that it's not so simple when it comes to training youth triathletes. Okay, with that, let me know if you have other questions down the road. Dr. Rekha, back to you. Okay. Um, so, so as you can tell uh, from the picture, right, um, it's very, very difficult to distinguish uh, just looking at someone, uh, what age they are, right? And so your training metrics will also have to change. Um, after knowing, uh, you know, what stage of development your, your athlete is. And when we look at stages of development, um, we look at multiple ones. Uh, first one is, is the biological age, obviously how, how old, how are your athletes going? And a great example of this is that most people have a garden in these days. And when you, when you do a high intense workout, uh, you can go in Gardening Connect and it will tell you Sorry, guys, we may just have lost uh, Dr. Rekha. Let's just give him a, a bit. Sorry, guys, is this uh, better? Okay, so uh, um, apologies. Uh, there's no power here in Pune and, and it's raining quite heavily. So I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. <laughs> um, so we'll go into, the, <laughs> we'll go into the stages of development. Uh, you know, how do we categorize uh, children in the stages they are? And uh, okay, Rupam, thank you very much. Um, the first one is the biological age. And I was, I was giving you an example that most of us have a Garmin. So your chronological age is, you know, obviously your birth date wise age. But when you, when you do a hard workout, especially, and you do a, a good training, uh, you know, plan, maybe it's three months, six months, you will start seeing that your athletic age 
starts to diminish or go go below, go lower, which means your your body is telling you that you're getting younger than your chronological age. But it's very difficult to to put that in youth, right? And um, the first thing we we try to look is to see the step by step how how quickly are they gaining weight is one of the metrics uh, doctors look at. How quickly are they gaining height? Are they at the national average for each country in weight and height in that ratio? Um, obviously, chronological age and the age by years. The next thing is the is the development age, and again, it's another metric that we use to see uh, where an athlete uh, is. There's simple tests one can do to see uh, what development age uh, the child is at or the youth is at. security again this one is tricky. Uh, women especially or, or young girls are going to display um and uh, obviously going to be a little more social and have uh, you know a little more cognitive maturity and very is than most of your youth males uh, the next one is your training age. Obviously, it's important to, to know. All right. Uh, actually, uh, now. Yes, no. If you can give me a thumbs up. It would be really helpful. Better? Okay, Rupam, thank you very much. Um, the next one uh, I was talking about uh, is obviously how long have athletes been training? And that is uh, very, very important. So just to give you an example, if someone has been swimming from the age of five, as opposed to an athlete who started swimming at age eight or nine, athlete who started swimming at five is going to have a much bigger duration. Um, and they are probably going to be at a little advanced level than someone who's just starting fresh off the block. Okay. Um, so what is the what is the model that we that we use um, to look at? Uh, you know, your athlete development. The first one, you know, obviously is from age six to nine and the word I'll just wait for someone to answer if they can see the slide. Okay, perfect. Uh, so obviously the first one uh, is the first three letters fun are highlighted. So age six to nine, uh, you want to uh, focus on basic movement skills. Um, obviously, uh, you know, you want to give those kids uh, some body weight exercises. Obviously, you have to be very, very careful in, in utilizing uh, exercises such as push-ups, pull-ups. Uh, they may need assistance, especially on the pull-ups. Um, you have to be very, very careful if you're going to give them, you know, basic, simple sit-ups. Uh, make sure their form is right. Most importantly, in this, this age group, you want to introduce them to as many sports as possible. Uh, a small caveat is that their balance and handling is not developed at this age. So be careful if, they are, if you are going to introduce them to sports uh, such as cycling, especially. Okay. Um, the next age group, obviously, is the learn to train. Uh, again, like I said, uh, the girls are in this from 8 to 11. They're going to hit puberty roughly around 11, 12, whereas the boys are in that 9 to 12 age group. Uh, this is where we start um, giving them specific skills of sport. Uh, this is where usually the youth competition starts, whether it's individual or teams. Um, the objective here is to, you know, start teaching them, uh, you know, simple aspects that we use in training, such as a proper way to do warm up, proper way to do cool down, basic stretching, because by now their cognitive skills are starting to develop. Uh, they can understand 
directions much more. The third one is the train to train. I, I really love this term, train to train. Um, again, uh, 12 to 16 for the boys, 11 to 15 for the girls. Uh, this is where they are likely hit puberty. Uh, so you can start developing endurance. Uh, this is where usually a lot of cross-country training uh, is, uh, you know, sort of given uh, to, to, to kids. Uh, obviously, they are going to start seeing changes in strength as well. So this is a good time to start adding light uh, strength training, uh, not full blown, but slowly progressing them. Uh, obviously, to help them maintain uh, flexibility, because this is the time where, where especially, uh, you know, males are going to start developing much more. They're going to start, you're going to start seeing them get taller all of a sudden. So it's important to uh, keep them flexible. And uh, obviously, uh, this is this age group, I would say, is one of the most competitive ones in India. Uh, you know, 16 is when most Indian kids, unfortunately, uh, will get into the ninth and 10th standards and, and parents start worrying about uh, what college is my son or daughter going to go to. Um, so this is where uh, competition uh, starts increasing, whether it's, you know, at district level or, or state level, or you get the school nationals or the CBS, CBSE nationals, one of them. Um, but the next category, 16 and above, is obviously, uh, the, you know, the train to compete. Obviously, um, now the goal has shifted to winning medals, whether it's for your university or your college or you, for your country. And then the last one, obviously, is, you know, the transition uh, where you're going to become more of an amateur to a professional athlete, where now you are training to win. Um, obviously, you're going to see a high amount of intensity, high amount of volume. Obviously, you're going to have to categorize your races. Um, and then, you know, you'll have to develop a strong training program that will help you uh, peak for these races. So your performance is the key in this train to win. Okay, next. Um, so this, uh, this is just a simple uh, chart which tells you, and this will be put on YouTube, so you can take a look uh, as a tool that gives you a guideline. Uh, this is one for females, uh, you know, when you see the rate of growth, um, you know, from ages six to six to 19, uh, you know, what can you do? So start uh, adding some speed, uh, six to eight years, um, you know, the flexibility is from six to 10 years. Obviously you want to, like I said, add skill training between eight and 11, uh, be very, very careful uh, when they start hitting puberty, uh, and again, after the onset of puberty, you can get on to, you know, more of an aerobic endurance, uh, start building a good aerobic base. And usually 13, 14, uh, they've hit uh, puberty, they're ready to take on strength training. Um, and then uh, it's very comparable and similar to males as well. So the next chart uh, will show you uh, for the males, just keep in mind that, uh, you know, the speed does change a little bit for males. Uh, it was six to eight for females here. We're looking at introducing speed between ages seven and nine. Again, skill training, like I said, it's uh, nine to 12 years. Um, and again, uh, males are going to start uh, hitting a growth spurt somewhere between that 13 to 14. So you can really start adding some strength training program, usually done. Um, a good 12 to 18 months after they hit puberty. So keep these, uh, keep these two charts handy. Um, they are going to be very, very useful when you start structuring a training program for young, for young children and youth. Dr. Radka, uh, if I may just yeah. add, if that's good. Yep. So I, I'm just going to uh, add on a little bit about some of these golden nuggets you can take home, especially for those of you who are coaches or parents with young athletes. So I'm going to bring you back to um, the female chart. Um, just to give you a little bit more information, because I know it's quite a lot of stuff on one chart. Uh, periods of accelerated adaptation actually means um, if you were to focus on developing these specific components at the correct time, that child and youth would have his, his ability 
be very quickly developed and possibly um, he will gain an advantage in that sense. So what do I mean by advantage? So I'll give you an example. Sorry, I'm just going to... Uh, mute off some of the guys. Okay, so I hope you can hear me again. So, um, sorry. I just want to draw your attention to what we call or term as peak height velocity over here. So if you can see that. So peak height velocity is basically the fastest rate of growth of change of height during a, a child who is going through puberty. So this peak height velocity um, is something which right now, most countries are using the measurement of peak height velocity to actually track puberty. Now, the big question as parents and coaches, we always ask this question, how do we define that puberty has started uh, we utilize this tool called peak height velocity. Now for the girls, if menstruation or the menstruation cycle has begun, it is very clear that they already have uh, begun their peak height velocity. So if you have a young teenage girl who has her monarchy cycle on, you can rest assured that she has already begun puberty. Now using peak height velocity, uh, we also can trace backwards using estimates of understanding these periods of accelerated adaptation. So what I mean is, for example, you understand that once puberty has finished, it is the best time. I'll repeat that. It's the best time for you to start building on aerobic endurance for that young girl. It's also the best time to go into very gradual but formal strength training programs. Now, just before peak height velocity, you can also see that there is a component of developing speed. So in the whole cycle of a youth, there are two windows of opportunity between six to eight years old and 11 to 13. Now, these two different speed windows gives you a little more uh, potential for the child to quickly build speed. And speed is a very important component in triathlon. And this is something I need you guys to take note. Many people assume that triathlon is a spot on endurance, but I'll show you that a lot of speed is required for triathlon. So yesterday we had a conversation uh, with some of us, if, and, and that's what we'll cover on Friday itself. That speed in triathlon actually means that for world-class world runner, the men are running under 20, 20, 29 minutes, or 29 minutes and the women are running at 32, 33. So what exactly is speed? Okay, so I hope this gives you an, a, a good idea of when are the best times to develop particular areas. And for the boys, it's a little bit different. Obviously the peak height velocity occurs much later. And so they can also begin aerobic endurance training. Now just take note, I'll just add on what Dr. Rekha mentioned. The strength training component comes in a little bit later because most boys have very significant change in bone density and the bone growth itself. And hence, that's why they require 12 to 8 months more after PHV so that they will not have growth-related injuries. And for those of you who are familiar or you work with young teenage boys, you realize simple things like osteoskeletal disease or if they have shin issues with pain, uh, that cannot be accounted for, those could possibly, not always the case, be growth-related issues. So you want to just back off the strength training a little, and it usually comes 12 to 18 months after. Other than that, all the other components, as you can see, remains pretty much uh, within the same type of uh, pattern, and it's all taking its dressing from peak height velocity. All right? Now, one last thing before I hand this back over to Dr. Rekha. If you look at both slides, you will see that there is this skill. So what is skill training? So India, you, in India, it's uh, cricket, I suppose, is one of the most famous sports. Or it's the most popular sport. So if you are going to get a child to learn a new skill or want him to excel at picking up skills fast, you would look at the skill training phase. And so it's 8 to 11 for girls, roughly, and 9 to 12 for boys. And in triathlon, let's bring that back to triathlon. 
Many age groupers are struggling with swimming. Why do they struggle with swimming? Because they cannot get the internal rotation right. high elbow in the swim. And that's because the skill acquisition, if you start swimming at the age of 35, it's going to be an uphill task. However, if you introduce swimming at a much younger age, about eight or nine, that child is going to be able to feel the water. He's going to be able to get the internal rotation. Okay. And it's going to be much easier for someone learning swimming at a much younger age. And I hope this can give you a good indication of how you utilize these uh, phases. Okay. Um, I'm going to hand this over back to right. Dr. Rector. Here you go. I've All spoken right. too much. Thanks. Sir. No, no, thank you very much for uh, clarifying a couple of things. Uh, so that was really, very useful. And again, we discussed some, you know, age appropriate development. Uh, again, based on the chart, you can go and see what, what periods uh, complement uh, to what adaptation. So if I were to ask you, you know, which, which would be the type of development uh, based on uh, biological maturity? And that's a question you have to ask yourself based on the age group that you coach. So, for example, uh, if I have athletes who are between seven and 10, um, would I be giving them any endurance running or endurance uh, swimming? So you can type in your answer, yes, no, maybe, perhaps, uh, whatever you feel. No, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely not. Uh, obviously, you want to save the endurance bit for a, for a little later on. So everyone's hitting no now, very good. Thank you very much. Um, similar to that, you know, if, if I have athletes between six and six and 10 and six and 11, uh, do I really want them jumping on hurdles or do I really want them involved in any contact sports? So you can type in, type in your answers on that one. No, yeah, Kavish, great answer. So yeah, you want to save, uh, you know, you want to save team sports. Yes, but perfect. So yeah, obviously you want to encourage and have team games, and we'll cover that in the later slide. But, uh, oh, there's an interesting answer which says yes. Um, so obviously no contact <laughs> till, they were, till they are 13 or 14, right? It's going to be very, very difficult. Uh, similar, um, do you really want uh, you know, young kids riding on the road and at least age six and 10? Absolutely not. You want, to, you want to encourage cycling because they're still gaining their balance and their gait but you want to do it in a closed environment, right? So you know where the road is closed or a lot of kids are going to ride in their, in their colony where, where they know there's going to be a restricted movement. Um, one of the biggest mistakes that coaches and parents make is that they consider their age to be similar to their child's age. And then they start pushing things on the child, uh, thinking that they will be able to adapt much more. Um, so be very, very careful uh, that you're not overbearing too much, especially on the young children between six and 10, six and 11. Uh, let them develop basic skills and then you can slowly add stuff. Okay, so um, just some fun uh, training tips. Obviously, uh, you know, any, any young kids that you coach, uh, you have to be creative, uh, otherwise they'll get bored and they will never show up again. If you try and do the same sessions over and over, it's not going to be fun. It's going to be really monotonous. And that's pro probably a, a good reason why so many people are interested in triathlon is that there's no monotony uh, in the workouts that we do, right? As opposed to just one sport like running or cycling. There's always something different going on in our calendar on a daily basis. Um, give athletes the luxury to create uh, you know, new skills New drills, uh, one of my favorite, favorite thing is that I give uh, my youth uh, fun games in the pool. I give them a kickboard or a pull by and I, I make them create their own games. And it's a lot of fun to see how they, how they develop. Um, obviously try and 
give them a, a variety of skills, you know, running backwards, running sideways. Um, if you have grass available, small hops, bunny jumps, you know, lateral jumps. Obviously, uh, like I said before, uh, start introducing games, but change the rules of the games um, so that they start using their cognitive mindset. Um, they're learning new skills, but they're also strategizing uh, while getting at it. Uh, focus on flexibility. Flexibility is very, very, very important. I wish I would have seen this lecture 30 years ago. Um, I'm pretty horrible in flexibility myself. Uh, and same with balance. Uh, you know, there was none of this uh, talk going on uh, when I was competing. So flexibility, balance, uh, it's going to be a key asset uh, when they are competing and actually lifelong. Um, so it's same as coordination. And then you can introduce ball games. So simple ball drains. Uh, obviously, cricket is huge. Uh, soccer or football, uh, basketball. Uh, when we when we look at training, uh, try and make the training invisible. And, and one of our favorite activities when I was uh, in swimming at IUP uh, was that the coach used to drop us um, at a park and we used to play games. And then as part of the training, we didn't even realize we had to jog back to the swimming pool, which was roughly uh, a three to four K distance. And at back that time, we just were divided in teams. And we used to think that the, the fastest person to get is gonna get, uh, you know, get a medal or get the, the evening off from practice. It was just his way of making us run that distance. Um, obviously use playgrounds and national surroundings. I know it's, it's been a little difficult uh, given the situation we are in, but as much as possible, uh, if you have access to you know community playgrounds or society playgrounds, please use them. Uh, most importantly, um, teach kids to have fun. Um, and I'll give you an example of my son uh, that uh, he's going to be five in October. And last year, just before uh, COVID hit, uh, we had enrolled him into a uh, you know a basketball type program where you know, they were teaching the fundamental skills, but, uh, you know, the instructors were so, so intense uh, that uh, most of the young kids uh, between ages four and seven were literally scared. Uh, it wasn't fun. And like it says, they won't stay, uh, including my son. They never went back. Um, so make sure we don't, we don't make these mistakes of pushing kids too hard, too young. Uh, give them the opportunity to, to enjoy whatever sport it is that they choose. And then later on, you can get them into a more competitive spirit. Um, last bit of training tips, obviously, uh, like has been discussed, consider the, you know, the chronological, biological, and training age, uh, make plans which are adaptive to those. Uh, keep in mind, I already spoke about this earlier, that uh, the girls are going to have different growing patterns. Uh, so especially as coaches, parents, uh, we have to be a little more empathetic towards that uh, uh, on both ends, uh, dealing, with, dealing with boys who may lag behind because girls are going to grow faster. And as, as girls start hitting puberty, you have to understand what they go through. So, so offer as much support as much. Um, yeah, too much too early. Uh, obviously, there's a big reason why some athletes who start competing at ages six to 10, uh, don't really don't really make it later on because they tend to burn out. Um, if competition becomes too intense, uh, the pressure is just too much. Some athletes just land up quitting uh, because it, they can't handle the pressure and it's not fun, right? Uh, leads right into the next point that play and enjoy other sports, which is huge growing up. Uh, my parents actually uh, did not like this much, but uh, even though I was a national level swimmer, I played tennis for my college. I played cricket for my college. I played table tennis. Um, I used to play soccer with my friends. So try and engage uh, your, your athletes in uh, other sports, especially in the off season, uh, so that it's, it's fun for them. And you'll be surprised how much strategy they can gain from other sports as well. Uh, obviously, different motivations is huge and motivations can change. And it's true for every single one of us who's uh, listening to this. So all of us have days when we are really motivated, we are really looking forward to that week's workout. And then we have days when the next day comes and you just don't even want to get out of bed. Start being 
a little more empathetic uh, towards your kids, uh, towards the kids that you coach, that even they are going to suffer motivation. Um, and then when their motivation is low, figure out ways that activities are fun and they will still take part. Um, again, I think we've said this enough times already, too much too early uh, can lead to burnout. So be very, very careful and you know play as many sports as possible. Uh, sorry, can I just add in, um, if I may? Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing that uh, I've brought uh, my personal experience with uh, coaching, um, I used to work with athletics, and I found that um, through my journey, sometimes we need to be very clear about the definition of speed. So when we're talking about speed development, that's exposing to a child whereby he's going to develop a very quick ability to turn over his arms and legs. That's, the, that's one component of uh, extremity speed. The other component of speed would actually be that top end speed, which will obviously pay dividends down the road. Now, when you are talking about developing speed in its purest form, you're talking about distances over 30 meters to 60 meters. That's pure speed. Uh, one of the big misconceptions is people assume that running 400 meters or 800 meters would actually be speed, and that's not speed at all. Yes, it may be speed training in an Ironman type training, but that's not speed in its purest form. Now, why I'm highlighting this is because when you put an interval that uh, goes past speed and, and, and touches the speed endurance component, uh, that young child is going to be at a lot of, uh, it's going to be uh, generating a lot of lactate buildup. And trust me, huge lactate levels are very, very uncomfortable. Uh, for those of you who came from a swimming background, if your coach made you swim 100 repeats all out, uh, or if you ran 300 meters on the track all out, you would know what that feels like. Now, as what Dr. Rekha mentioned, be careful because there's a huge, young children do not like that kind of pain and they cannot tell the difference between uh, the kind of pain and why I need to go through that to be good. So if you're talking about a young child again, guys, you have to be very sensitive that uh, getting them to be exposed, especially to a misconception of what speed is and uh, exposure to too much lactate buildup is very, very unpleasant, okay? So um, I hope you found that useful. Um, I hand this back over to Dr. Rector. Okay, so uh, we'll discuss a little bit about uh, the specialization uh, that happens. Uh, again, we're, you can always refer back to the two charts that usually talked about in detail as well. Um, that, you know, what can you add when someone is six to 10? And then how you can slowly translate that from 11 to, to 18. Um, the, the best point about here is that it says and swimming. Uh, so majority of us triathletes, um, I'm actually not the, I'm the exception to the rule that majority of us started swimming at a young age. So try and expose uh, your youth or your kids to swimming, even if it's just done as a life-saving activity, right? Even if they know how to, how to swim, that's gonna pay dividends later on in life. And unfortunately in India, that's the last thing that, that gets put. And I think Eugene wants to make a point. Good, okay. Uh, um, again, uh, again we, we have limited resources in terms of gymnastics and figure skating, but if you put them into a, a basic you know, athletic program, they are going to teach them you know, some coordination, a little bit of tumbling, uh, just make sure uh, they have enough uh, mats uh, before they are, uh, if, you, if you see kids doing cartwheels uh, and rolling on their back on the mud, uh, there's a big issue. Uh, so be very, very careful of the environment uh, that you put your kids or someone you know is putting their kids in. Uh, late specialization, obviously, uh, we look at, obviously, when someone is, is beyond 14, beyond 16 is when we start introducing that you know, long distance, uh, you know, cycling, long distance running, um, and how that translates to performance later on. Keep in mind that uh, kids can be taught, uh, you know, techniques from a very young age. So as, as young as seven, 
Uh, you can start teaching them what's the right way to run. That's not what we are talking about here, but you don't want seven to 10 year olds running 10 Ks. And it happens quite, quite a lot. So be very, very careful because they're just not ready. Their hearts are not uh, similar to what our developed hearts are. So you have to be patient uh, with them. Similar with cycling skills, they are still learning in a coordination and balance. Like I said earlier in, in the, Nirmal is saying hi, Nirmal, hi. Uh, like I said before, uh, because someone is new to cycling, be, be careful in what type of environment they learn cycling. Later on, obviously you're gonna start moving more towards the performance aspect. Um, you know, how are they pedaling? How are they gaining speed? So be careful about specializing early versus late. Um, so we, we have sat, we've discussed this a little bit, but just to give you a few, few things to keep in mind that if you expose kids at a very young age, uh, you know, to specialization uh, in sports, you may have a few issues. Um, obviously, if they haven't hit puberty and you're starting to push them, uh, there's going to be a lot of overview, overuse injuries, uh, especially in young swimmers. You see that uh, those who are really doing heavy workouts from ages eight, nine, uh, by the time you know they get to 11, 12, uh, the most common complaint is shoulder tendonitis, uh, especially uh, if they're doing a lot of freestyle and butterfly. Uh, again, uh, you know, there's a lot, lack of physical literacy, uh, which can lower performance. You may think that, uh, uh, you know, just pushing them will increase their performance. It's not, not so much the case. Uh, again, pushing kids too hard, too fast, too soon, um, trying to get them into a competitive spirit at a very young age can lead to mental burnout. I've seen that happen, uh, with me, and I still see that happening around me a lot. That uh, you know, even even athletes our age come out too strong, and within the first year, they want to move from a one k to a full marathon. And by the time the year comes in, they are done after just finishing one one marathon because uh, they're just not enjoying. They're not enjoying the process. Uh, they've gone too hard too soon. They either got themselves injured or just mentally it's becoming you know too overwhelming to get up every morning and do a workout. We don't want to see that, especially in young adults and the youth. Um, obviously, like I said before, 14 to 16, especially in India, is where you see um, a lot of kids retire from sport. It's, it's funny that they're retiring at that age. It's that age when they can really start seeing uh, impact uh, for all the hard work they've done in the past, but they've just burnt out. They can't handle the pressure. And, uh, you know, they just decide to focus on their studies or whatever that is, but they do not want to be associated with one sport. Okay. Um, what I'd like you to do, just get a bit of, uh, to break, to get a bit of fun right now. In the chat right now, guys. So if you see the first line, agility, balance, and coordination, can you type in one sport, not triathlon, which you think can develop agility, balance, and coordination? Type it in right now. What are the, some of the sports? Yes, tennis, gymnastics, football. Swimming. Swimming, badminton, soccer. What's the number one sport in India? Cricket. Yeah, cricket. Where is uh where the guys from Tamil Nadu? Where what 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 um what is uh where are you guys housed in? What spot is that? With your courts. Something India is pretty good at as well. Rowing, okay. Now you have an Olympic rower. Um, not so much of agility, uh, good coordination. Yes, puja squash. Okay, so. Um, that's some of the sports and you realize that all sports, many sports develop agility, balance and coordination. Next one, running, jumping and throwing. What sports? Type it in the chat that has one of, at least two of this, running and jumping or jumping and throwing. Track and field. Volleyball, basketball. Yeah. Nice. Cricket. Someone's put cricket. Handball. Yes. Yeah, good one. Okay, water polo. 
water polo, no running, swimming. Okay, last line. So we have a little, it gets a bit um, tricky with the word. So let's remember KGB, uh, the Russian secret police. <laughs> you can remember that? Okay, KGB is kinesthetic, gliding, buoyancy, and striking. Okay, I'm going to explain what kinesthetics mean. It's the feel, feel of things. So for those of you who are swimming, you hear this all the time, feel of water. Can you feel that? If you're out of the water, Dr. Rekha, for three days, what happens? When you hop back in, you can't feel the water. Can't feel the water, yeah. Yes, and in COVID, some people have not been swimming for uh, more than a year. So you can't You're in half that now, fear. you're in half. <laughs> Again, a half. Okay, so feel of the water. Another one, guys, if you play basketball, and when you shoot the ball, you will actually know if the ball can go in or not just by that shot. That's also few. Okay. Uh, what spot has gliding? Type it in. What spot has gliding? A gliding component. Swimming. What else? Apart from swimming. Jumping. Okay. Yes, skating. Well done, guys. Skating, skate scooter, skiing. That's gliding. Okay. Next one. It's this simple buoyancy. What? There's only one or two spots that has buoyancy. <laughs> yeah. And that's swimming. Okay. And the last one, striking. There's two types of striking. One, striking with your limbs. What kind of sports involve striking with your limbs? Karate, judo. Yes, mush, martial oh. arts, football. Okay, you kick the ball. Yeah. So martial arts. How about <laughs> striking? <laughs> striking with an implement. What's India's top spot again? Cricket, badminton, squash. So have you seen some kids when the ball comes and they cannot hit the ball? Seen that in tennis? Okay, because you don't have that hand-eye coordination, yeah. right? Okay, so good one, guys. I hope you have some good examples. Yes, Mitun, Sabata Crawl. Very nice. So these are what we talked about, physical literacy. And remember, all children should have an exposure to all these three. You can remember ABCs, RJTs, KGBs, Russian police. So that will give you that whenever program, and even in triathlon, don't just swim, bike, and run. In swimming, don't just swim, 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 and swim, because you're going to get injured and you're going to get burnt out, right? So think about how you can incorporate this, and it's very important as well. All right, so back to you, Dr. Redka. Okay, so um, coming up towards the end of our uh, presentation and then we'll answer some questions. So uh, just some, again, practical tools, you know, how and when do we plan training? Um, again, uh, ages seven to 12, uh, it says sampling here, which means basically try and expose them uh, to as many sports as possible, work on, you know, their balance, their flexibility, um, hand-eye coordination, all the good stuff. Uh, 12 plus is recreational. Again, you're going to start uh, keep working on the basic basic stuff, you know, start adding warm up and cool down, teach them uh, the basic skills that we, even we implement. You're going to have some competition at this age. Uh, so again, try and make it fun. Don't, don't make it too intense. Uh, specializing is usually when you start seeing choose one sport over the other. Uh, happens a lot in India that, you know, uh, kids want to play cricket and badminton or cricket and basketball. Uh, cricket and football. Um, so this is where you start saying that, okay, uh, as a parent or as a coach, we need to choose one or the other so they can uh, do a little better. Investment is, again, that's what I was saying, if they don't burn out too soon is 15 is when we start uh, really going specialized training uh, because they have now uh, well beyond puberty. They've gained a lot of strength. They've gained a lot of height. Um, and this is where the competition is going to get intense as well. Uh, plus, they have developed all the motor skills necessary that they can start handling, you know, higher workouts. They can start uh, working on their aerobic zones as well. Um, so, 
you know, uh, the first thing, first things first is to keep in mind why do why do people take part in sport? Uh, and that is a question you have to ask yourself uh, when a new trainee or, or your kid signs up for a program, right? Um, and first thing is that a uh, lot of us are in sport to get fit, but we also want to enjoy uh, what sport brings to us. Uh, so in the sampling phase, we're looking, uh, you know, the kids to play, um, have fun uh, while working uh, on basic skills. Uh, again, expose them to as many sports as possible. Uh, specifically for triathlon, uh, if you do have someone, then keep in mind that swim and run train techniques can be included at that age. But be careful about the bike. Uh, again, try and do bike skills in a closed environment. Um, other sports, again, uh, try and avoid as much non-contact um, or very minimal contact in case you are teaching them to play football or basketball, one of them. Uh, specializing, again, you're going to narrow down. Like I said, I gave you a couple examples that you want to really now start focusing on one sport, uh, whether it's triathlon or cricket or basketball, whatever that is. I hope the answer is triathlon. Uh, because it is for the ITF that I'm doing this talk. Um, in triathlon, uh, you know, specifically, uh, you can focus on one sport over the other. Uh, keep in mind that, you know, we consider triathlon, swim, bike, run as one. But in between, uh, you can have someone's, if someone's weakness is swimming or someone's weakness like mine is cycling, uh, you can now start specializing and adding more sessions. Uh, to turn that weakness into a strength. Obviously, investment um, is, is where you go all in. Uh, it's mostly where that, yep, uh, increasing workout, increasing intensity. Uh, again, uh, for triathletes, uh, you know, any, any level of triathlete bike becomes a big focus because, uh, you know, that's where the maximum volume is, even on race day. Uh, and you have to do the minimum sessions on the bike to get really fast. Obviously, you want to maintain swim and run. So you may have to create a cyclic plan where, where the volumes are now interchanged between uh, the run or the brick. And then one, one, the, or one week or the next week is more on the bike. Um, in the investment phase, obviously, you are going to be focusing on one sport and one sport only. Uh, even most of us listening to the talk are uh, just plain and simple triathletes. I don't think anyone here is is doing competitive triathlon along with competitive any other sport. We just don't, uh, triathletes just don't have the time to even do uh, swim, bike, run, and strength. So I just can't imagine anyone going into another sport as well. Uh, I'll just say, hop in right here. Um, this is yep. one of the most interesting trends and it's coming along not just with nations who are good in triathlon. And I'll mention what countries these are. So. If you look at the United States, uh, Great Britain, Australia, um, especially with the junior athletes, most of them end up as national top level runners as well. Here in Singapore, uh, the fastest distant runners tend to come from uh, a triathlon background and it's very interesting. Uh, so yes, as much as we don't encourage triathletes to be national athletes at two different spots. Uh, this is a trend that you will see. And one of the reasons why um, triathlon or triathletes, obviously the standard of running is increasing. Um, you also find that many triathletes remain injury free because they are actually running way less, but yet the total amount of volume of training can actually be more than a, a, a normal uh, distance runner. So that's an interesting fun fact for you to, to know. And for those of you who in the next couple of years begin to start working with good, talented, hardworking traffic, you will also find that most of them will rank, rise up the rank of uh, at least state level and be very good state level runners. Yeah, so that's something for you to take note. Puja, do you want to hop in on this to make some comments about what you've seen with uh, good runners uh, in, in triathlon? You are, you are completely right. And even I myself have been one of the example for that. When I was into competitive triathlon, I also used to participate in swimming races and win national medals over there also. I was also like getting selected for national running competitions also. So yes, 
tri uh, tri are that one breed who are much better than uh, a single uh, individual sport athlete like a swimmer or a runner or a cyclist due to the kind of training plan that we focus on nice yeah, someone uh, someone's made a comment that uh, most of his triathletes are water polo players obviously you need uh, strength as well a uh, lot of endurance to play water yes. polo so that yeah yeah and that naturally and translates the on the bike yeah and power as well uh, so if anyone here has not played water polo please please give it a whirl uh, and don't blame me <laughs> for doing that um so just some uh, you know take home messages uh, before we take any questions uh, you know when you're dealing with uh, you know children and youth uh try to add as much enjoyment and try to uh try to give them a lot of play time make sessions fun um watch the distance like i said uh, especially adolescents pre puberty uh we're not training them to be marathon runners as yet uh so keep a good eye on the distance uh, a rule of thumb is that if you're doing something don't try and enforce that uh on the kids that you train uh very important and i've i spoke about this that you know focus on basic skills initially uh, like i said when i was when i was swimming competitively i i wish someone would have given me this presentation uh, on my flexibility and coordination uh beware of the adult mold um, like eugene pointed out in the picture right it's very very some kids will hit puberty uh, at a earlier stage so it's very very uh, easy to get carried away and feel like now they are uh more of a young adult and we start pushing them uh again injury prevention is huge uh these kids are growing uh we have to make sure we give the the you know their bones and their muscles uh the respect that they deserve uh last but not least and this is very very important uh teach them positive values and ethics uh you know sport is meant to uh bring you know people together sport is a great way uh for nation building uh, there's so many characteristics characteristics that sport has given me and a lot of uh, people around me uh so having having a positive outcome of positive uh, mindset as we know in the past year has been very very important um ethics are very very important so try and start uh, teaching them uh, respecting their opponents uh fair play uh you know staying away from supplements all of those good points from a young age and they will translate uh into into a good program later on so and that is that uh i'll just add on uh just before we go to the questions so um i just want to comment a little for all you guys think so you seen this word beware of the adult mole um it's i think many of us have heard Heard that before? I'll just give you a bit of data based on my personal experience, and this is not just in triathlon but across all sports. So, um, my background includes working for close to eight years at a Singapore sports school, and I believe in India as well, in, at state level and even at national level, you do have schools which uh, specialize in in sport. Now, uh, one of the things I just um, one of the things that I found was that. a lot of the school going kids that were recruited by the sports schools in singapore we found that they were all born in the first half of the year so 86% of them were born in the first half of the year and what does that mean so in one of the presentations on friday uh, we will talk about talent identification many of us are actually not picking real talent a lot of systems are actually picking youths who have gone through puberty and what you find is many of the talented youths as dr ka mentioned earlier we talk about the biological age and the training age youths who have a good head start with both biological and training age will obviously show better results when you conduct a special talent selection test based on time or speed and youths who are late in the game in puberty will not be selected so it's something you want to also think about because one of the most common mistakes i see especially in coaching as well is oh he's a big tall strong boy but don't forget being tall and strong doesn't mean cognitively 
or by emotions and socially, he's ready to take that kind of training stress. Because as you know, a boy is not meant to do a man's job. So he can be 1.85 meters tall, but he can still behave like a 10 year old inside his head because he's still, yeah. I, I think you guys know where I'm heading. So um, be really cautious about this adult mode. It doesn't mean that a child who is big and strong at a young age means that he can take an adult's load. Uh, don't get caught into that trap. All right, cool. Um, let's take some questions. So I'm gonna invite Dr. Bretka uh, and Puja as well. Uh, so Puja is a World Triathlon Level 2 coach as well. And uh, I want to bring her experience with working with um, athletes, not just in her own uh, area, but also from an Indian perspective. And so together with myself, we hope to answer some of your questions this evening. Okay, so uh, put your questions through into the chat. And I'm going to start with a first one. Uh, so there was a question asking about will running affect the height of children? I talk too much, so someone else should talk. <laughs> so will running, will running affect growth of a child? Also? Um, it depends. Yeah, I, yeah, sure, I'll answer. Uh, it depends what kind of running you're talking about, right? So uh, if someone is running just for pl play between 7 and 11, 7 or 12, it's not really going to have a negative impact. Now, if you have 7 to 12 years old and they're running 5Ks, obviously they are going to have, it's going to have a negative impact. So like uh, the chart said, you have to be very, very careful. And um, so most cross-country uh, programs um, or track programs, uh, you know, worldwide start at around age 12. When they start, uh, you know, coaching young young kids to now start gaining up to 5K. So keep that in mind. Up till 12, try and limit the amount of distance uh, anyone is running. Yeah. So just to add on that, and this is a question which I think some of you are at the back of it. So running and strength training, do they stun your growth? And the answer in the research shows that no, it doesn't. Um, this misconception of stunting your growth uh, was found to have two key reasons or actually one key reason. Um, there's a lot of research with the Japanese and they found that kids who were excessively involved with a lot of impact sport and strength training at the same time, the reason for their inability to reach uh, potential height was due to the fact of a uh, lack of nutrition. I'll repeat that, it's a lack of nutrition. And what that means is that when you're talking about uh, a young child who's doing cricket and swimming and football and then long distance running, you need to be very careful that he's getting enough nutrition to support his growth. So the research has already shown that. On that note, do take note that children pre-adolescents have issues with their growth plates. So it does not affect the height, but when you're talking about growth platelets, uh, it can be deformed because uh, prior to puberty, they are not completely uh, developed. And so that's something you want to take note of, especially if you're working with impact sport like jumping games or a lot of running, okay? So I hope that answered your question. The next question would be, which age would be perfect to develop motor ability? You can develop your motor abilities as, at a very young age, because that's like as a basic uh, ability that we, we play with our kids, like with very young age of like three, four years onwards, you can make them play with your balls or maybe they can uh, like start learning some uh, coordination skills and all. So yeah, motor ability can be developed at very young age, three, four years onwards. Thanks Pooja. And to add on that, how young can youth travel on start? Sorry? How young can a youth start triathlon? 
how young can a kid start triathlon? 14, 15 onwards. Uh, you they can, can actually go they younger. Can run. Yeah. Yeah, they can yeah. learn. They can start learning at the age of 12, 13. But yeah, the competition, yeah. actual competition would be somewhere around 14, 15. Uh, I'll just hop into my piece. I think uh, kids seven or eight, if you can swim, cycle, and run, you can you can do triathlon just, just for fun. So, yeah, there, that's cute. There are events for like tricycle, with the tricycle for younger kids for triathlon. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so then uh, again, I think I an answered the question on weight training and the effect of children. Just uh, recap again, it's usually a nutrition component that if you are including a lot of training, the child has to eat right. And just might be mindful that a lot of young teenagers and youth do not eat well. They just choose uh, poor choices of food. <laughs> Am I right, Dr. Redka? <laughs> Bubble tea. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, ice that. cream, ice cream McDonald's. takes, ice cream yeah. takes. Yeah, exactly. And and a point with strength training in in youth is that focus on posture and breathing. It's very very important. You teach them the right posture and breathing. Even if it's body weight, you have to focus on that because that's the that's the first thing I see uh, in a lot of these child programs that uh, you know they're doing sit ups and pull ups and push ups and and the form is just horrid. So yeah, you can introduce them to body weight conditioning, but focus a lot on the posture. Okay, next question is, uh, it's gonna be a, quite a tricky one and I'll get Pooja to get this. Uh, does being vegan affect an, a benefit an athlete? And I hope you're asking in terms from a youth perspective. So uh, Pooja, do you wanna hop in on this? Uh, I would not try to change a diet for a youth. Because I would prefer that they should have all kinds of nutrients at this age because they are developing. Uh, I'm not personally a vegan fan. Of course, I, I would ask to avoid non-vegetarian because of the inflammation that is um, connected to it. But yeah, for youth, I would not suggest you to have any kind of those vegan specific diet or something. And it's different from vegetarian, right? Yes, it is different from yeah. vegetarian. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so basically no dairy. Yeah. I yeah. don't think uh, for youth, we would suggest to go for no dairy products. Go like, vegan. They should yeah. eat dairy products. Thanks for that, guys. Um, next one from Kavish. Um, is it agreeable that early training age gives better athletes? So you're talking about Ultra marathons, uh, full marathons, Ironman. Considering that they were late into the sport, so is there any disadvantage? Um, so let me rephrase that again. Um, if you got in a spot late in the late twenties, does uh, training at an early age give them an advantage? I think Dr. Rekha, this uh, is probably, uh, your question. Yeah, I think, um, look, if you are training at a young age or you know the skill set, it obviously will pay dividends later on. And the clear example is swimming, right? So if you learn swimming at a young age, uh, you will have a little bit of an advantage. Uh, but the problem is the younger you start, the, the likelihood of someone burning out is also much higher. Um, so it's not an easy answer to give one way or another. Yeah, if all things equal, yes, the younger you start uh, swimming, cycling, running, you will be in shape than someone who's fresh off the block. But uh, at the end of the day, it comes down to, you know, smart training, your discipline, your nutrition, your strength training. And if you do all of those things right, um, then let's say 25 years on, it's an it's a even, even skill set to have. And you, um, you have a lot of examples in triathlon, especially where, where a top level athletes are late bloomers. They started at 25, 26, and are now world champions. Uh, Nicola Spirik is a great example. Uh, at 40, 41, she's, she's going in the Olympics and very likely she will medal. Daniela Reef, again, uh, she's one of the examples who started young, but now she's blossomed into an Ironman, Ironman athlete. Okay. Pooja, question for you from Kevin. Yeah. When should you start zone training for kids? So um, 
mostly what happens with kids is like they don't even have proper equipments to measure their zone or anything so yeah um, i mean if we talk about indian kids the ones that i am training even if i want them to start their zone training at the age of uh, 10 or 11 but i wouldn't have proper equipment to measure that um uh, this is this and, might take and also there is another thing that with kids they have higher hr also so we have to uh, think about that also we cannot calculate kids at hr exactly like the way we did with adults so um kevin you has this question i'm going to draw you back to this slide i hope you can see this so for kids uh, this is my experience i i wouldn't even use zones now if you're working with a kid who is pre puberty i would develop two key things speed and skill and it's always speed and skill and it's very easy to develop speed and skill because you don't need zones for that does does that make sense so it would be um as i said what is speed it's just really short fast stuff and kids are really good at going fast um dr rekha you have a five year old son i believe he has yeah. only two speeds yep. stop and go <laughs> there's no can you slow down yeah. him no he will stop when he needs to no. stop yeah so yeah. it's just stop don't walk the stop or go and they go at max effort so kevin i hope that gives you some uh, idea yep and go a ahead. lot of times the stop comes exactly when you don't want it to come so keep in mind <laughs> <laughs> and it's a hard stop he will just sit down and that's the end of yeah. that that's 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 a sign that my strength training program is now started okay uh we have a next question how long does it take to become a mature experienced triathlete if you're talking about world class um so i'll comment from an olympic perspective and then maybe uh dr rekha you can hop in on the ironman distance so a olympic athlete would need close to about 8 to 10 years span life cycle so if you are looking at uh, someone making it to the olympic games in 2020 2024 you should already have an indian athlete racing on the world cup circuit right now not junior not finding them they should already be race, racing at the wts or world cup circuit now So if you are looking at the next Olympic Games in 2028 and that's in uh, the United States I think it's Los Angeles uh this would be the perfect time. So you have about an 8 year cycle and this athlete would roughly be of age 14 or 15. So that's typically now uh there is this saying 10 years or 10,000 hours. I think it's quite subjective because if the quality of coaching is exponentially improved uh you still need a number of years but you might not need 10 years in that sense okay so i uh dr rekha you want to talk about successful ironman world class athlete elite ironman guys yeah yeah i mean elite ironman where champions are somewhere in this age group of 30 to 34 uh, roughly uh, for the women and for the men it's actually between 34 and 37 38 when they start peaking uh keep in mind that a lot of these guys have cycled from a ITU or a WTS uh for a few years i mean 5 to 8 years of their life is dedicated for that yan fredino is a great example he was a gold medalist then he translated to half ironman distances for 4 to 5 years again daniel arif same and now they are you know at the peak of their career as ironman athletes so you're looking at a again a 10 to 12 to 14 year cycle uh so it's not easy you need to have the you know, skills at a you know smaller distance then you graduate again the john uh, you know elister and uh, his brother are now getting into you know half man uh, how it gomez is now a half ironman champion he still hasn't hit the full ironman circuit so give yourself 10 to 12 years from now again someone who's doing half ironman somewhere in that 415 to 430 range right now has a good chance 5 to 8 years down the line Uh, to become an ironman champion javier gomez has still one more olympic games yeah yeah yes one yeah. more yeah he's not going to leave that easily 
Okay, good. Thanks for that. Uh, I'm going to go to the next question. Um, so if you are 17 and a swimmer, how would you start triathlon? Puja, do you want to get that? Yeah. Uh, so if you're a swimmer and at 17, you might have started running also. And I think when mostly in India, I have seen this thing, most of the athletes that have uh, got into triathlon are of age uh, 16, 17. Once they try their level best in swimming or running, and then later on they decide to get into triathlon. So uh, it's not that difficult. You just have to start focusing on your cycling skill and improve your running at the same time. Uh, maybe by 19, you can be a good triathlete. And if okay. I can add, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, start slow because swimmers for them, 3,800 is, is not much of a distance. But at 18, if you're thinking I'm going to go for an Ironman, you're going to be in a lot of trouble uh, because of just to go from an Olympic, so 40 kilometers of cycling to 180 takes years and years of practice. So my advice is do a sprint, see how you like it, do Olympic uh, a few times, then you know keep adding the next step. Yes, and this is the trend that I have seen in India that everyone wants to directly jump into half and full Ironman rather, rather than starting it slow. Before even knowing the sport, they want to go into the longer distance and that is like horrible. They end up having injuries because of that. So yeah, as Kostuk said, start slow, start with sprint, do it a couple of times, get into that rhythm, understand the sport and then move forward. So uh, this also adds on to Santhil's question about muscle development. So just be, be careful because uh, a lot of swimmers, when they come into the sport of triathlon, uh, they tend to be like a fish out of water. So as Dr. Rekha mentioned, be careful with the running volume because many of them, as much as they are very fit, they're fit from swimming. So they have a very strong heart, uh, excellent development of aerobic capacity, but just be careful with the run volume because especially for those of them who are slightly heavier from muscle mass, um, running too much, too fast, too soon is going to be a little tricky. Okay. And also I would like to add something over here. When I switched from swimming to triathlon, I, and I started doing more of cycling training, I came to know that I, I am having issues with my traps because of the hyperlexic that I developed you know, during my swimming career. Yeah, that can also be uh, one of the problems that you might face because of uh, the swimming, we are hyper flexible. We develop, we have flexibility, but we lack strength, which is required for triathlon. So we need to uh, focus on that part also. Okay, uh, I'll get a next question. Any type of bike you should use for kids or adults? Uh, this is quite straightforward. For kids, start with any bike. Um, even a mountain bike would do. Um, start with whatever they're comfortable with. Don't get caught up into the trap of uh, getting the fastest bike out there. As uh, you heard just now from Dr. Recker, uh, kids need time and to work on developing their balance and coordination. So expect that the child is going to be falling with that bike. Same with adults. If you are new to the sport, I suggest to get a secondhand bike. And when you fall with your bike and you're bound to fall a couple of times, <laughs> it will save you a bit of a heart issues. So yeah, yeah I hope that's yeah. Most important, most important is to make sure that the bike uh, fits. And right now, the, if you work with a good coach, uh, I'm very sure the coach will be able to give you some basic uh, sizing and fitting tips on how to get a good bike. Okay, so my, my advice to you is don't, don't spend a fortune on it. Start with whatever. Even if you have something lying at the back of your home, it's perfectly fine. Okay, so make sure that you, you can go with that. Um, for those of you, there are quite a number of questions. Um, this isn't a swimming webinar, unfortunately. My, my advice to you is work with, uh, invest in coaching. <laughs> uh, there are coaches here, so invest in coaching. Uh, it's something I think many of us tend to shun away from. Remember that 
um, coaches bring a lot of value and it helps you to exper expedite a lot of the issues you have. Okay, so for those of you who are looking at improving your swimming speed. Yeah, and same yeah. with nutrition as well. Uh, there's some questions coming in on nutrition, so it's best to have an expert guide them uh, because everyone's nutrition demands are different. Uh, so it'll be very difficult, you know, uh, to know are they even getting enough resources from their uh, basic diet before uh, before allowing them to you know discuss on supplements or something like that. I and, personally don't uh, want yeah. to let. Uh, sorry, I personally don't let any of my uh, athletes, like young athletes, go for any supplement. I prefer them to have uh, nutrients from the natural food. Yeah. So if it's like really, really needed to get into supplement, then only go for it. Otherwise, prefer the natural food. Yeah, I think young athletes should look for real food. Uh, and if they really are suffering from a particular deficiency, get that checked out with a medical professional. Um, as you know, even coaches, we aren't uh, qualified to dispense some information. So I think even you go to Dr. Rekha, he might even send you off to a, a qualified nutritionist or dietitian uh, to whether that young child actually needs supplements or not. No. In certain cases, I believe, yes, they can, they can help to that extent. Okay. Last question. Um, so you talk about Brownlee brothers and Ian Fredano. So they graduated at longer distances. Uh, and is it advisable to pursue a particular distance for entire career? And how would you be versatile? Okay, so um, I'll just give you my, my two cents on these guys. I've watched the Brownlee brothers race from age 18. I was fortunate enough to work with them on the ITU projects. Uh, where we were exposed to them, where Alistair um, came in the Olympic Games in 2008. So in his first Olympic Games, he was obviously a very promising athlete and he went on to perform as where he is. Ian Fridano um, was also at his first Olympic Games in 2008 in Beijing. Uh, he went on to win the Olympic Games and then he transited into the longer distance. And you're right, Javier Gomez has been around for a very long time. And one common thing I can assure you for all these three athletes, that all three have tremendous amount of speed. So all of these three guys, uh, especially Javier and the Brownlee brothers are all running, for instance, they are 28 minute 10K runners. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you can relate how fast 28 minutes over 10K so and yeah. That's off the bike end. I, <laughs> yeah. I have, I have uh, raced with them during my world championships in Australia. And, you know, they, they show that speed on the screen yes. over there. I could see they're running around 22, 23 kilometer per hour speed. And at that point of time, it was like, wow. Yeah. So uh, they always have speed. And if just for you to understand again, uh, in terms of swimming ability. So Javier is a pool swimmer. He's able to swim 16.45. Uh, he, he did win one of his state swimming 1005 championships uh, in Spain. And so the natural progression for the four of them would be as they start to get older, they lose the ability. And this is very relative. They lose the ability to stay competitive with the younger guys. And if you look at the upcoming Olympic Games, you have the, the Norwegians, uh, you have the French and uh, these are all the young guys up and coming. And I think they are struggling because age is not on their side. Now, when they progress up to the 70.3, it's technically racing at a slower speed and just holding that speed. And then they move up to the Ironman, whereby uh, they're even going at a much slower speed and they're just sitting around for the distance. So... If you look at what's happening, most of them in the trend that has happened over the last 15 years is the really fast guys are now trying to extend their professional career by moving into the longer distances so that they aren't as fast as before, but at the same time, they're still being very competitive. Yeah, so that's, that's what the strategy is for them in terms of extension of their uh, careers. 
So obviously, there are also those out of the norm. There are also good Ironman athletes who did not come from a very successful ITU background, but have also been very successful. Um, and it just goes to show that endurance across the board, whether you're elite or an age group, can be developed with uh, over time and space. It can develop. So if you start the sport at 30, uh, you can still be a very good marathon runner. You can still run under three hours, but to break 210, maybe that's going to be pretty difficult. Okay. Uh, Dr. Redka, do you want to add on about extension of careers? Yeah, I mean, I think there's nothing wrong in, in sticking to one distance for the rest of your life. If you like something, if you enjoy it, I mean, Usain Bolt only ran the 100 and the 200 and the relays, and he was very, very happy. Um, and so is, so is the case with a lot of swimmers as well. Uh, you know, the swimmers will do one particular event and a relay. Uh, there's very few like Michael Phelps who, who are the jack of all trades who will do seven, eight events. Um, you can't do seven, eight events in Olympics, but if you like the sprint and the Olympic distance, try to be your best version in that distance. Just because someone is upgrading to uh, you know half Ironman or a full Ironman, you don't necessarily have to do it. Uh, I feel you can totally, you can do those events for fun, but you will have to decide, do you really want to work on speed and power like Eugene explained or you want to be on the on the older side of things uh, where you get to sit around for 12, 12 hours um, and race you know Ironman distances right so thank you so much hey nice so I think uh, we've got quite a amount of questions uh, thank you very much for the questions um, What's going to happen is we're going to have our trivia. And Harish, if you're still uh, around, how many prizes do we have today? <laughs> because Pooja's thinking of the questions. <laughs> the same five. Same five. Wow. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, ladies first. Maybe you'll go with two, and then uh, Dr. Raka will go with two, and I'll go for one. Questions okay. for the day. So, which is the correct age to develop speed in female? Like, what are the two slots where Happy you can... Chat. Nine. Both Seven of them. Nine. Okay, so After, the first one... You have to one. mention both the blocks. Yes, both blocks. Both blocks, right in. Uh, it looks like oh. Pradip. Pradip has got it. He's got the two blocks. So yeah. we'll give that to Pradip. Nice. Okay, second question. Dr. Ratka. Uh, this is a tricky one for me, myself. Um, so at what age uh, would you add competition to both uh, boys and girls? What? It's really quick. <laughs> <laughs> 15 plus. Who wrote who one with 15? Okay, so the first answer would be anyone put 15? Pratik. Is it Pratik? Yeah, Pratik and Ojwal says 15 plus. Okay, 15 plus is the answer. So, yep. no one put 15. Pratik, uh, uh, okay. 15. Okay. Okay, good. Back to Puja. One more question from you. So, uh, what will be the right age to get into into multiple sports, like developing sports. What will be the right age to put your kid into sport? Oh, someone fun. said six, winner. Nikhil yeah. Pawar, winner, six. Nice. <laughs> Good. Last question from you, Dr. Rekha. All right, so um, just give me an example of a 
of a different variation of a skill you would do uh, with an, with a child six to nine. What is something you can you can add to their training to make it fun? Pool fun game, puja, pool fun game. Yeah, you want to make it fun. You want to make them run backwards, uh, make them run sideways. So puja is, puja is one. Okay, last question from me. So um, how many years would you look at if you're looking at a having an athlete trying to be high performance or qualify for the Olympic Games. Okay, Pratik, have you won Pratik? How many years? Bijan's put 10. Okay, got that. Bijan's Bijain, put 10. First okay, one. so Bijan, you got that. Okay, so thank you very much, guys. Um, I hope you had a good time. Um, Harash, do you have any questions or things you want to make a comment before we call it a close for the evening? I'm good. I think uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Puja and Eugene for uh, patiently answering everybody's question. Uh, and it's great to see good participation. Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, it will continue for the next five days too. Um, as again, as I said earlier, if you have any questions, free, uh, feel free to write to us. Uh, we have recorded this session as well, and this will be made available on the Indian Triathlon YouTube uh, channel as well. You can have a look at it. Uh, that's it from my side. Uh, Eugene, if you want to add anything, you can. Um, okay, so what's going to happen tomorrow is um, Puja, you're up yeah. with myself and we're going to look at swimming and running and so uh, I know it's going to be a little tough from zoom but we're going to try to run through some of the basic skills that are required very important especially if you're looking at developing the sport and so we're going to try to revisit what we talked about fundamentals of swimming and running in triathlon itself okay so I hope to see you. For those of you who have friends who missed out this session, I encourage you to get them back on. Uh, it is still not too late to join the next couple of days because we'll be running this entire program till the end of the week. And it's going to get pretty technical as well. So otherwise, thank you very much from Dr. Puja and myself. And I wish you a great evening. And we will see you tomorrow. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Hey guys. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pooja, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hi, sir. Thank you. Okay, see you everyone, see you tomorrow.